much the arts panelists for having me here. Um, I love doing these events because the audience are great as well as the speakers always. Um, so this is Global Lunar Day, uh, the first but hopefully not the last. Um, here on the penultimate day of the um, Republic of the Moon exhibition, still open tomorrow. Um, and we're going to be talking about all things to do with the moon from various different perspectives. So we've got a really good lineup of interdisciplinary speakers here for you today. Um, I see my role as moderator today primarily as um, keeping time. I've been told that I must rein in speakers um, if they're going over, and so um, everybody's going to be speaking for about 25 minutes, and we'll take brief questions after each speaker, but then um, just for a few minutes, then we'll move on to the next speaker, and we should, um, if we keep things uh, running along at the right pace, have a good hour at the end for further discussion. So if you have a question that you don't get a chance to ask after an individual speaker, sit tight because there will be time at the end. So I'm sort of a, a glorified um, alarm clock up here and I'll be, and I'll be <coughs> um, running things as such. Also, as audience members, um, we do welcome comments and this is very much a discussion and you guys are very much part of this, but you know, be sensitive to the fact that there are other people who have questions. So. Um, if you could also keep yourself um, a bit uh, In addition, just to mention that we are live streaming, and so we don't just have everyone in the audience here. We have people um, around the world who will be watching us. We're using the hashtag moon today, and we'll also be taking questions um, from that audience via Twitter, and we do usually have people come in and, and comment, so welcome to everyone. I just have a couple of housekeeping points. Yes, it off. okay. Uh, the first one is if you yourself have a device, um, the Wi-Fi here is called Art Catalyst BH, and your password is Art Question Mark Catalyst, all in lowercase. Okay, and for some reason there's another hashtag there. That's yeah, that's the old Luna Day was... Okay, right, so we are actually using time. hashtags now. Oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. And if anybody needs to use the toilet, uh, the toilets are not generally provided for the exhibition, but they are for you as conference members. You have to go all the way along through the moon geese, turn right, turn the left, <laughs> through recolonize the moon, yeah. you will then see a sign saying no entry. <laughs> you will go through that and you can follow the <laughs> If an invigilator stops you from going through that, please say that you are part of Global Lunar Day and you've been told that you can do it. <laughs> You're like, good, I have to go through that. That was one of the strangest housekeeping statements I've heard of. <laughs> possibly ever. I've never thought of that before. Note that because of the live streaming, um, we even though you might be able to hear us in this room, we will be passing around mic. That goes for the question too, and that's so that it can be picked up um, onto the, the video. This is also going to be recorded, and so it'll be available later on as well. So if you do have a question, you put your hand up. Please wait, and Rob will bring you a microphone. So with that, I want to move on to introducing our first speaker. Um, we're very lucky to have one of the world's leading um, moon scientists with us here today, Bernard Coyne. Um, he's been with the European Space Agency for more than 20 years. Um, he's also the executive director of the International Lunar um, Exploration Working Group. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about his current work because I think he's going to be speaking about that. But I would also just point out that one of the things that I've always um, respected uh, Bernard for is that he was the, the father of SMART-1, which was Europe's first mission to the moon. Um, it was conceived in the 1990s, launched in 2003, went into the moon's orbit in 2004, and then um, a word that I always I like, it was a controlled impact, um, i.e. it was crashed in the moon's surface um, in 2006. Um, having said that, even, even that impact did have scientific purposes. They could see the flash and, and learn things from the plume that came off of that. So um, we're very um, lucky to have him over here today from Holland. and. Well, thanks very much. Uh, so, welcome to the moon. Happy New Lunar Year. That's why I, I put my uh, Lunar New Year outfit for you today. I have some Chinese ancestry, so we celebrate the New Moon, which is also the okay, the New Lunar Year. And as you see, also uh, our Chinese uh, colleagues have been very strong in lunar exploration. So we want also to pay tribute to them. Thanks very much, uh, Rob, Jill, all the organizers uh, of this. Um, uh, Moon Republic, Vive la République, Vive la Lune. 
So, so it's, a, uh, it, it's a good pleasure to be here. Um, I was I enjoyed very much also going through the exhibition, uh, the different uh, parts of artists. I recommend you to go there. Um, and this interplay between uh, explorers, scientists, artists, uh, all enthusiasts that you are, I think it's great. And we hope to recruit among you uh, those that are going to help us uh, to promote exploration or to also share and engage ourselves in exploration. So I'm talking here on behalf of the International Lunar Exploration Banking Group. It's a forum that includes space agencies but also other stakeholders, uh, um, individual companies, uh, academics, uh, artists as well. And, um, and I will uh, still uh, take uh, some uh, material from missions, recent uh, lunar mission, to see you, oh my god, we have learned so much about the moon, and there is so much still to learn, to explore, and we have to prepare to the next steps. The next steps where we are going to put a robotic village on the moon, where we are going to have an international lunar base. Hopefully we put also the first European women on the moon to show how we are advanced. And, um, and also we have a lot of projects that can engage everybody. So I will uh, start as a, um, Jill had mentioned about uh, Smart One and uh, what we have done with our mission. So 50 years after exploration, that's where we are around the Earth with all these satellites and debris around uh, the Earth. And uh, I want also to promote that this year is also a year of comet. In ESA, we have just uh, uh, our, have woken up our uh, comet mission, and we are hoping to land on the comet in uh, November. So it will be a great feat for exploration. Um, as you know, uh, the space is very close to us. In our daily life, artificial uh, satellites, but also natural uh, <coughs> asteroids come to impact the Earth, and they have done that so for the last uh, since the Earth is born. And you can read this record of impact all over where? On a book which is just 307 kilometers from here. It's called the Moon. It's a book where you have recorded all the uh, history of bombardment in the solar <coughs> And eventually you see some pieces here uh, of what comes from out of space, but you can also go to space and explore. And that's what we have done with uh, what uh, was the first ESA mission to the moon, smart one, small missions for advanced research and technology. Actually it was not a moon mission, it was a mission to demonstrate technologies to travel in deep space uh, to um, miniaturization of the instrument. And we found the best place to test these technologies was to go to moon. And then eventually we tried also to involve the scientists to build instruments. So we had some instruments built in the UK, from France, Italy, and other countries. And we brought them along. So this uh, mission um, was built in three years. So it was approved. And then in three years at that time, we worked very hard in, with a very integrated team with um, industry uh, as well, with uh, scientists, engineers. And then we launched it on a beautiful rocket, Ariane 5. Very efficient, very cheap, because we shared the launch with two other satellites, one uh, Indian satellite actually, <laughs> and uh, they paid most of the bill. <laughs> but eventually, uh, using solar power alone, and electric propulsion, that's a system where you transform solar power in electricity, and from this you inject ions at high speed, you can go to the moon spending five times less fuel than with chemical propulsion. So we got into the Guinness Book of Records because we just spent 60 liters of fuel to go to the moon. And that's 307 kilometers in direct distance that, in fact, you made, you made many orbits, and it was like 10 million kilometers we had to reach. So I think, uh, I don't know if you have a car, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's very efficient uh, uh, mileage per gallon, as uh, our American colleagues said. So we got into the Guinness Book of Records about 16 years ago. Then uh, I was very uh, proud to say that uh, one year in the book of uh, Guinness. The year after, I see another Guinness Book of Records, the longest mission to the moon. It took us 18 months to go to the moon. The American did it in five days, but they gave it to the time. <laughs> and, but that's what you pay uh, to uh, be very efficient. But the great thing that during this cruise, 
we could observe the Earth. We could test some of the technology. We could um, also um, um, go through the radiation belt and demonstrate some technologies that are now used for uh, telecommunication satellites and applications. Eventually, we reached the moon. And so after launch in 2003, we reached the moon in, in 2004. And then around the moon, we had a, a, a phase of six months in orbit, and then that was extended to one year and a half, where we studied questions that are relevant to planetary science in general. For instance, what shaped planets? Tectonics is, you know, records of a planet that tell you about the thermal history, the internal evolution of the planet. We looked also at uh, craters, at volcanism, and at polar region. We were looking also to tackle a big issue, which is how did the moon form? And we believe now that the moon was formed 4.5 billion years ago when an embryo the size of Mars, an embryo of a planet, impacted the young Earth. And this uh, took place, we are not sure actually, so there is a debate now, maybe 50 million years after the formation of the Earth. So you could say uh, it's, uh, it was uh, quite early, it was a, when the Earth was about 1% of its current age. It was quite a young class. And we believe that this impact, but uh, still there is a lot of controversy. We think there was an impact, but there are many ingredients we don't understand. And maybe you, with the next speaker, we'll look over this, uh, about the science of the moon. Um, but clearly, uh, this is a process that has uh, shaped the moon, but also had a strong influence on the early evolution of the Earth itself. And possibly, the very anomalous situation where you have a moon so big compared to the uh, mother planet. It's very typical in our solar system. Makes our Earth very unique in the solar system and maybe also in, uh, in the galaxy. And we have uh, now some proof that the presence of the moon had an effect in the early geological evolution of the Earth, but also lately in the climatic evolution of the Earth. The moon has stabilized the rotation of the Earth and very stable planet. So very rare Earth conditions. So we uh, used our Smart One mission to study volcanic processes on the moon. Here, for this is uh, for those of you that can see, sorry for you at the back. Um, okay, I, I can give you a telescope you can see here. It's a lava, it's a lava tube that is um, a lava river. If you want the telescope, I brought it for you. <laughs> Use it uh, at night uh, to observe the moon. But it's a lava river that was carved by a volcanic uh, flow on a preceding lava plain. It's uh, like a lava tube on Earth, except it's 120 kilometers long, one kilometer wide. So we mapped it with a smart one. And very interestingly, it's also the place where the Apollo 15 crew landed. So you can see also the area. And we could compare data from orbit and data that the astronauts had obtained. First, we could uh, validate that, uh, yes, it, they have been there. Everything that they had uh, taken as pictures are consistent with the one we took. So we are happy about that. But clearly, we could uh, see very well um, how to interpret their local measurements in the global context. Here, I have put also a very nice uh, picture of the moon. Do you recognize this one? It's the first picture of the moon that was taken ever, 400 years ago, by Galileo himself. And here is a place where Apollo 15 has uh, landed. We also uh, made the maps of the moon. And uh, we hope that these maps will be used for, for you when you travel there as a uh, travel guide. So this is a map that uh, I came actually with a, a master student. She did a stage with me. And she put some uh, 50 images that we took by smart at different times to build the mosaic of the lunar south pole. And here you see the Shackleton crater, you know the Shackleton polar explorer. So we named craters uh, um, after great scientists and great explorers. I can wish you to have a crater, but in other conditions they must be dead. So at the proper time, eventually, you know, we hope that uh, we are going to explore some of these areas there. Uh, the South Pole, and there are areas which are in permanent shadow, 
the coldest in the solar system, but other which see a lot of light. And eventually we look at going there, and we found with smart one a place that is very close to the South Pole, which is almost always in sunlight. And this is a place where we would like to land with a robot, a rover, a land and rover, and using solar power alone, we could survive forever. And so we, we are looking at uh, using these maps to uh, prepare the next robotic exploration of the moon. And eventually, in place, an international lunar base there. So we uh, did a number of science studies, as I've described, but eventually we ran out of fuel around the moon, and then our destiny was to crash on the surface of the moon at a speed of two kilometers per second. But using the last drop of fuel, we could just maneuver the time of the impact so that we could observe it from Earth. And so you see, here is a map we obtained before, and here are observations that were acquired from Hawaii, Canada France Hawaii telescope. And 10 seconds after I saw the radio signal disappear from my baby probe, 10 seconds after I saw this beautiful first images of a flash and a cloud of debris. So it was quite an emotional uh, moment, like we have uh, from time to time in uh, lunar exploration. Uh, eventually, we could also estimate that uh, um, the impact was, uh, that's true indeed a crash, but it was so grazing that the spacecraft bounced on the moon. And uh, there, there are a cloud of debris and some element of the spacecraft, we call them sculpture, so first art pieces that uh, we could look for in the future. So, man-made uh, uh, sculpture on the surface of the moon. So with a plume that extends over 50 kilometers from impact. With smart one also, so we did some large scale images. From the, this is the site of Apollo 11. You could say one of the most boring sites on the moon. <laughs> because it was selected to be the safest to land. No boulder, no slope, and so on. And here is the place where the Apollo astronaut landed. And uh, if you use the telescope, you could see that uh, the, with a new mission, Lunar Kansas Orbiter, they were even able to image the lander from Apollo 11. So eventually, okay, Smart One was built to demonstrate technologies, but also to prepare for future missions. Like we have a Mercury mission called Baby Colombo that is to be launched uh, in two years from now, and we will use some element of solar electric propulsion, some miniaturized instrument, uh, some various uh, uh, systems on board. Now I would like to show how uh, is a panorama of recent missions. So within the International Lunar Exploration Working Group, we have a roadmap for exploration. We have a first phase of precursor mission in orbit, then missions on the surface, rovers, then more uh, extended rovers in a robotic village that can uh, deploy assets that will be used by astronauts in a lunar base, outpost, and then a permanent in the international lunar base. So it's a kind of a phased approach. And de facto, all over the world, the different space agencies countries have started to build up the elements for this uh, uh, roadmap. And for instance, these are results obtained by our Japanese colleagues who won the mission called First Selene and after success was called Kaguya. And B, we talk about more the, about uh, the other aspect of uh, Kaguya and other ferries of the lunar exploration. Here is a map of the gravity field of the moon. Well, you can see also something. This is the near side where you recognize some of these impact basins where there are some mass anomalies and here the far side, which is looking completely different. And actually, you could see, of course, we see only the near side. Um, uh, the near side has some of this mare dark area, but uh, after the first image of the far side, you could see that the far side is very different. It's more highlands with very few uh, impact basins filled with lava. And also in gravity, the moon is very dissimilar. It's a big puzzle still. How did that happen? Eventually, our Kavila colleague also went, ran out of fuel and had to impact and landing on the mission that we had on Smart One. And we took images of their landing strip with Smart One and we helped them to observe also the impact of Kavila. Uh, 
Then um, we were also uh, very happy to uh, engage in a collaboration with our Indian colleague, the colleague from the Indian, Indian Space Research Organization that were developing a mission called Chandrayaan-1, where ESA uh, has provided three instruments that are building on the smart one uh, technology. And eventually Chandrayaan-1 studied the moon and made some profound discoveries on the minerals of the moon and also on the presence of hydrated minerals on the surface of the moon. You can see here a map. And in the pole, and not only in the area of permanent shadow, they found some um, hydration molecules. So that's OH uh, for chemists. And part of it could be due to ice, part of it could be due to water, or water integrated into minerals. It's possible that, in fact, the solar wind comes in form of protons and interacts with the minerals on the surface to create hydration signature. In fact, you could see that this time, this signature is changing this time, so the moon is breathing, in fact, of its uh, um, water content at the pole. And here is okay, a map of this hydration signature that uh, was uh, shown by Chandran Wan. Also, the American had uh, a kind of, uh, you know, American way, a sent a probe and bombed the moon <laughs> with a, a probe which was just 10 times bigger than smart one at the highest speed. <laughs> and uh, uh, anybody really American, uh, this, uh, I feel uh, these are my big friends, we had them actually, uh, to try to go in a place <coughs> where they could excavate uh, in the polar region, some region which is rich in ice, and eventually they found the fingerprint of water in what they had excavated the existing part. So they had also the independent proof of the presence of ice in the pool. To a fraction of a few percent of ice mixed with uh, dust. Then we move to uh, our Chinese uh, colleague. So with the uh, Chang'e one. Uh, um, it's a great, uh, we have a great friendship with the Chinese. Actually at the time of Smart One, when Smart One was around the moon, I was approached one at the conference by some uh, Chinese as already astronomers, they say, could we observe Smart One? Please give us a code to observe Smart One. Then we discuss and we communicate to them the coordinates and how they could receive the signal from Smart One. And they could validate all their radio observatories to observe Smart One. And then this way, they were ready to do the same when Chang'e One was launched. Eventually, this led to a collaboration where we also helped them with our own station to receive the data from Chang'e One. And beautiful data, so terrain map, so, so some X-ray map that we had on Smart One that allowed to map iron and some of the elements on the moon. And what is a very interesting in China, there is a very strong interest by the public and the politicians. You know, these uh, two persons that are unveiling the first image of Chang'e One is just the Prime Minister of China. So I hope that, uh, I wish we would have the same, that uh, the political uh, uh, a leader would be also as engaged in science, technology, and promoting exploration. And okay, so this I have described. Now, after this, we have also, you know, the American are, have declared a program for exploration. They, uh, they are, they are very strong in exploring Mars and some of the planets. Um, they had uh, launched a big lunar initiative, and this lunar initiative has been um, also um, debated in a sense, but de facto they are still continue to provide beautiful mission. This is a mission called the GRAIL. It's a, a gravity mission, a small class of mission, where they have made the best map of the moon gravity. They launched two spacecraft uh, that are monitoring with a very high accuracy within a fraction of a micron, the distance between the two spacecraft and the moon. Of the moon. This is the beauty of these uh, gravity maps. So do you recognize, uh, uh, who knows about moon geography? And uh, in the Republic of the Moon, we will have a very good uh, Republican school. And you will have to learn <laughs> lunar geography. Uh, so lunar geography, these are the, uh, the basins that are on the near side. You see the strong mass anomaly. Uh, so the, uh, this is, for instance, we have chrysium, here you have uh, uh, tranquilitatis, nectaris, 
and the far side is very different. Highlands, and there are also basins, but they are a bit compensated in gravity. So due to the fact that the, in fact the crust thickness is different from the far side. Okay, so that was geography lesson number one. And um, then de facto, you see, we had, starting with Smart One in 2003, a great decay of uh, robotic ex uh, orbital exploration with a fleet of uh, um, missions that went. We had Smart One, Kaguya, Chang'e One, Shang'e One, um, and Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that is still in operation. And I think we'll, we'll hear also some more with that about LRO. And now that this decade is over, we are entering into a new decade. The robotic surface exploration, where we are going to emplace the element of a, a global robotic village. And after the decade of fully, we'll have the, the decade of human outpost and international innovation. So let's talk about uh, uh, Chang'e 3. This is a, so after Chang'e 1, we saw the mission to the moon, the Chinese uh, had a spare spacecraft that they sent to the moon uh, to improve imaging. And then eventually, uh, they uh, left the moon to circumnavigate the moon, and then they even went to fly by an asteroid. Beautiful uh, field, we also had them. And then they had already a plan, a mission in, in uh, 2013, and they launched it on time, Chang'e 3, with a lander. Actually, they had prepared the Chang'e 2, some of the maneuver to go very close to the moon, uh, to, um, to do reconnaissance of where they would land. And then, uh, I think you have all seen uh, that uh, on TV or on the, on the web, uh, how they managed to, to land and to separate um, from the lander Jet Rabbit uh, or due to the, the rover. And it is this uh, great image. We had not seen such image since uh, the Luna 24 uh, rover that was in the 76. So, uh, so it was a great fit, and I'm okay, very jealous of my uh, colleagues that they could uh, achieve that. But uh, I hope that soon Europe also will be involved uh, more in full in this type of exploration with robots on the surface of the moon. So here's a separation, and it's a big challenge where they landed to survive the day, because the day can go up to 110 degrees Celsius temperature. So actually, they had, at noon, it was so hot that they had even to, to, uh, to nap a bit, to, to cope with the very high temperature at noon. And then in the morning, the evening is fine, and at night, you go to temperature of minus 170 degrees Celsius. And this is uh, what is uh, they are skidding. It's uh, so cold temperature that the electronics could die and the mechanism can die. So they have a strategy to cope uh, with uh, this cold temperature condition. They managed to survive one lunar night, woke up beautifully. But recently, uh, for the second lunar night, U2 um, has diagnosed some problems that has prevented, it seems, um, uh, some of the solar panels to, to close down, and the solar panels were supposed also to, to protect, like a cocoon, some of the sensitive electronics. So we had a very uh, emotional message that uh, the U2 rover or the U2 team has sent us, and it's not clear uh, if it's going to wake up on the 8th of February when the lunar day comes, but uh, the big lander itself, which is the main part of the mission, um, is very well. The U2 was supposed to last three months, it has at least worked very well for one month, we'll see. And we see also, I know that my colleagues are working very hard. They are not giving up uh, to see if eventually they can uh, okay, uh, reboost uh, uh, you to we see, we see more key posters. A beautiful view of the lander. Uh, I think the color choice is very, uh, very clear. <laughs> and actually, this was shocking to some of my colleagues. Oh my god, this is a big propaganda. And de facto, it's a lot of internal propaganda. It's having the Chinese proud to have uh, achieved that. I think that it's a great uh, achievement. Beautiful views of the U2 rover that has, you know, U2 rover um, has uh, moved like 100 meters already. So they traverse more than the Apollo 11 astronauts. So already it has done quite a great feat. Every of you, everybody of you could be involved. 
But here, the night of the landing, I went to my garden, deployed a bigger telescope than that, and uh, made an image of the moon. And then I say, oh, where is Sanger 3? Sanger 3 is here, so in this large part, uh, in Marie Embryon, just at the limit between two uh, volcanic uh, uh, unit on the moon. Very interesting area. Very, very nice evidence. And uh, this is what I did for my garden. Uh, my American colleagues, which had a better telescope uh, around the moon, were able even to spot uh, the lander and the rover. And so that's the image from the lunar sensor Vita compared to the panoramic image obtained from the camera on board the lander. Uh, after I will send you the, the images, huh? so, <laughs> and uh, and actually, what is interesting is that many of our colleagues all over the world, including American, they are trying to look at all this data from uh, Chang'e 3, and they are already starting to interpret the data that our colleagues have put uh, on. So let's go to the near future. On the robotic village, we have the Google Lunar X Prize. That's a competition where. A number of teams, 21, and I think at least uh, five very serious teams, uh, are supposed to go to the moon, land, uh, row for 500 meters, send uh, some videos, and uh, we give also opportunities for commercial development as well for science. I would like now to describe what we do in Europe in the United Persian. So we have done Smart One, we have collaborated with the Indian on Shanghai One and the Chinese on Chang'e One, Chang'e Three. The next step, we are looking in a collaboration with Russia on their next mission that are due uh, from next year to 2020. They are called Lunar Globe, Lunar Resource. And we are also uh, collaborating in a sample return mission from the poles after the 2020. So that's from the robotic side. From the human side, we have developed an engine that is able to talk to the space station. It's called the Automated Transfer Vehicle, ATV. We are going to reuse some of this high tech from this engine to couple it to a capsule built by the US called Orion. And with this engine, we are able to push Orion into the moon. We can bring four crew around the moon in orbit, and then they can come back in this capsule. And so we are planning to launch in 2017 the capsule in automatic mode, so empty to validate everything works well. And the idea in 2020, we will have four crew on board. And then we, uh, we are going to discuss whether there is a possibility to have one European <coughs> crew in this mission or in the next one. And my wish is to have the first European women to the moon there. So please support me. Mm. Start tweeting and spreading the good, uh, the good news, and talk to your, to your country. After this, we have a long-term plan to uh, go to the moon in an international lunar outpost, where we could put some container element, habitat, uh, laboratory module. Uh, see, uh, this could be the visa module, and uh, some uh, mobile element that can go to traverse and use an outpost and leading to international knowledge. Now, uh, much time ago, I would like to, yeah, I, I would like to end now in what could you do to help? And uh, we have developed with the EU and uh, with the space agency uh, at ESTEC and other agencies, some pilot project where we could involve scientists, engineers, artists, public, youth, uh, journalists, media, so we invite you to join some of our projects. For instance, we developed a project where we built a lander similar to the Google Lunar X Prize lander, and we tried to test it with some uh, engineering students, also with some geologists. We looked at uh, cooperative robotics. We have two rovers working with each other, with the lander. Uh, we looked at a um, system where we put on top of this lander a telescope in a similar way that the Chinese have done. On Chang'e 3, they put a telescope that is going to observe the Earth. Here we, we test the same system, and so I had a master student developing a system to control remotely these telescopes uh, to observe the sky. We have also some uh, um, astronaut training activities in a program called Euromoon Mars, where we sent uh, some um, astronaut uh, candidate or explorers uh, into extreme 
environment in the desert that are similar to the Moon and Mars. Here is, uh, for instance, a, they are sent for two weeks in an isolated habitat. You have a commander, an engineer, a biologist, a geologist, um, an artist, or a journalist together living isolated. They are not allowed to leave the habitat provided if they don't wear an extra vehicular suit. So we need the train as they would be living on the moon or Mars base. We had also some work where we tested a suit um, that is um, equipped with all biomedical sensors. And we look at how this uh, astronaut can uh, work together a rover or together a lander. And eventually we even tested how this astronaut could work in a lava tube, in a, in a volcanic uh, gallery, which is actually um, three hours drive from here, in the Eiffel volcanic uh, region. We had also a campaign in um, Austria in an ice cave, which is more similar to what you could even be found on Mars, uh, in the subsurface. And so we explored with these suits uh, some of this ice uh, cave. Uh, this is quite a large uh, area. Um, now we have also a, a project together with Alicia Femis uh, called the Moon Academy Workshop, where for uh, two weeks we gathered uh, um, artists, designers, scientists, engineers, architects to work on different projects. We call it Moon Academy. This led to exhibition, to um, conferences, uh, um, and to visit of uh, technical facilities. Um, we also created a Moon Store where some designers built this special uh, product that could be sold on the moon in the future. So we opened this store in Amsterdam. Um, we, uh, and we are looking at other projects, and I see that uh, uh, the Moon uh, Republic is also kind of uh, another version uh, locally of what you could do to celebrate how the moon is close to us and what we can do with the moon. Uh, in terms of education, training, outreach activities, we engaged the students from different universities to observe the moon. So these are images obtained by students. Uh, so tonight maybe we could try, yeah. Mm. Um, get some images of the moon and uh, share this. Go on a public place. We have campaign international observe the moon night. We could uh, do that. And um, in last year we had a, a six weeks program with art science uh, bachelor and master students called the Moon Earth, uh, it's space science and art. Here, for instance, is a project where using a spherical projection and an inflatable uh, sphere, uh, we can project the sky, we can also project an aurora or different other uh, sky or cosmic uh, phenomena. One project was to grow slime mold in space. <laughs> so these are slime mold uh, which are growing and um, uh, she's looking at how this experiment could be run on a lunar lander, for instance. This is uh, some of the space science uh, art students. This is a project where they produce uh, an aurora uh, using uh, some uh, cathodic TV tubes. Uh, and here is a mini um, lunar dome that was uh, developed by, uh, by an artist. Another project which I would like to involve you, we are making a general uh, cosmic study on what is the effect of Earth's moon portrait in our vision of the universe and uh, uh, vision of Earth? And you are very, you know this uh, iconic image of um, Apollo 8, and the Earth's rise over the moon. This is the one that I obtained with Mark 1, so I put it. We observe the Earth and the moon doing uh, uh, a total lunar eclipse. But so there are many such views of Earth and the moon obtained by different missions all over the world. So we'd like to study their impact and what they inspire to artists, to the public, and try to, uh, uh, to involve you in this study. And we can also support uh, uh, some, uh, some of the students that could make sense of this. This is another version from a very nice Thai kid in a conference we had at COSPA on uh, space exploration. Just 10 years old, very detailed view of exploration. So I would like to end with a calendar for this year, year when I would like really to invite you to participate. Uh, we had in January a big uh, event, so-called Dark Universe, with artists, uh, with uh, uh, scientists, 
uh, with uh, also sonic art. Uh, we have the beautiful uh, Moon Republic events uh, here, and I think it's important to bring that uh, around, possibly uh, find some follow-up uh, in uh, on the continent and, and elsewhere. In the European Space Technical Center, we are going to have a student planetary forum, mostly organized by students, with a mixture of geology students, art science students. So we'll have some presentation of the, some of the projects I have presented before. And um, in Vienna, we have the largest uh, geoscience event um, happening at the end of April in one week. So if any of you would have interest to, to, to um, produce, for instance, some either uh, posters or material or, or installation that could be presented to scientists, I have the opportunity to, to have it uh, there. And we have also a number of uh, events where the World Space Community is meeting in Toronto, and also a specific space expression conference at the International Space University in uh, October, where we are looking how to engage better you know, the, also the artists, the general public, in promoting uh, the role of space and exploration. So please uh, contact us and in the discussion, if we could, out of this, find some great follow-up project, let's uh, do that together. So, uh, uh, vive la République, vive la Lune. Thank you. To factual questions, no, not not lengthy questions. Oh, like I have one. You told me last night that there was water under the moon as well as on the poles. Yeah, okay, uh, but I think maybe you are putting the one question. Do you know that the moon maybe is wetter than the Earth? The, the Earth is a dry planet. If you take the amount of water in the bulk of the Earth. There is not so much. All the water is on the surface. In the case of the moon, from the latest uh, uh, analysis of samples that we brought back from the moon, some uh, laboratory measurements indicate quite strong uh, content in water. So maybe the moon is wetter than the earth inside and drier outside. So that's the kind of puzzle that says that there is still a lot to discover about the moon, and it tells us also about the formation of the earth. And then I have just one question, a simple answer, yes or no, to all of you. Should we return to the moon? Yes! yes. <laughs> so now raise your hand, are you ready for the travel? So are we going there? Who is ready for? Yes. <laughs> Very good, let's go to the moon. Thank you. Just one quick, one quick, quick question. question. I have a question that actually follows on from the one you just asked. There's lots of exciting things happening, and we're flinging things at the moon and seeing them explode. I'm wondering, what are the ethical or environmental considerations about how we feel it's okay to fling things at the moon? Because that hasn't always worked brilliantly down here on Earth. I see the very question, because actually, before we had a campaign of Smart One Control Impact, 40% of the question was about this. Are we going to damage the moon and so on? And actually, the impact of, of Smart One was equivalent to um, one kilogram meteorite hitting the moon, which happens every day on the moon. But uh, we use also the smart one measurement to really measure what was the environmental effect. So it, it was small factor compared to what Lunar Prospector did, but clearly in the future we have to find ways not to dispose of everything on the surface. So there are ways eventually to park some satellites in orbit around the moon, or the next generation, we will soft land them, so then it will be much... Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you.